Welcome! This tutorial will cover how to fill out Section C and D of FEMA's Elevation Certificate form correctly. It is part of a broader how-to series focusing on FEMA's Elevation Certificates. More specifically, how CRS would like you to complete them. For a full list of videos in this series, see the video description below. We are going to look at sections C and D together in this video since these are the sections that capture the survey information for the building and the certification of that information. Interestingly enough, the local floodplain administrator, or as the EC instructions say, the community official who is authorized by law or ordinance to administer the community's floodplain management ordinance, is also authorized to fill out section C. But these are very rare occurrences and can only occur when the local floodplain administrator completes Section C using elevation data from other documentation that has been signed and sealed by a licensed surveyor, engineer, or architect who is authorized by law to certify elevation information. That's a lot to take in, and we talk more about this in the video covering Section G of the form. Section C and D comprise page 2 of the EC. Section C contains the elevation data for the different floors of the building, the machinery and equipment servicing the building, and the grades adjacent to the building. It needs to be filled out for every EC, except for when a building is located in an AO zone or zone A without a BFE determined. When either of these is the case, sections E and F should be filled out instead. But I'll explain more about this in just a few moments. Section D contains the licensed professional's name, license number, signature, date, and seal. It also contains a very important comment section, which should probably have something in it on every EC. Starting with section C, let's look at the first field, C1. This field asks the certifier to identify which stage of construction the building is in. It is definitely a required field since both insurance and compliance rely on whether the building is finished or still under construction. For CRS purposes, you will only be asked to submit those ECs that are marked Finished Construction. We'll want to see the as-built elevations and information for a building, not anything prior to that. For permitting purposes, a community may require ECs at any point along the construction process as it's important to keep an eye on the building as it progresses. But for CRS purposes, be sure you are at least obtaining the ECs marked Finished Construction and reviewing or correcting those. An EC with two or more of these options marked is an error, as is an EC without any of these options marked. Interestingly enough though, there are two cases in which C1 can be left blank. When the building is in an unnumbered A zone and when it's in an AO zone. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, in these cases the person certifying the elevations just fills out section E and signs, dates, and provides comments in section F. That means that nothing is necessarily required in any part of Section C. However, it is strongly encouraged to have the licensed professional fill out C1 on every EC that is submitted. This ensures anyone reviewing this form clearly knows what stage of construction the building information is being certified for. There are three parts of C2 that can be filled out before getting to all the elevations starting in C2A and going through C2H. Those first three parts are the benchmark utilized, the vertical datum of that benchmark, and the datum used in the elevations in C2A through C2H. For CRS, we do not really check the benchmark utilized or the datum of it, since that doesn't necessarily tell us the most important part, what the datum of the elevations are. That's the third part and the part that's required to be filled out correctly. Also, be sure the datum marked here in C2 matches the datum in field B11. If they do not match, there must be an explanation in the comments section of how the surveyor converted the elevations in C2 to match the datum of the BFE given in B9. If the datum in C2 is blank or is different than the datum in B11 and there is no conversion explanation, then this is an error. Moving on to the elevations themselves, before we go through each one, I just want to point out that the local official is not required to make sure the elevations are correct here. The licensed professional certifies those with his or her signature and seal on the form. But it's the local official's duty to make sure the right elevations are filled out, seem about right, and make sense with the building diagram that's used in field A7. This is one of the trickiest things to do with the ECs. Also, elevations for all relevant floors, mechanical and equipment, and adjacent grades should always be given. If they are irrelevant to the building, an NA should be placed in the field. 
For example, if the EC is for a one-story slab on a gray building with no attached garage to it, an AE zone, the building would have an elevation for C2A. And since it's only a one-story building, it would not have an elevation for C2B. The EC instructions say to enter NA for this, so we expect to see an NA for C2B. We would also expect to see NA for C2C since this building is an AE zone, not a V zone. And since this building had an attached garage, we would expect to see an elevation for C2D, attached garage. I'll stop here. I just want to explain why and when the use of NA is required and when it is not. We strongly encourage the use of NA in all irrelevant fields for a building. But if the field is left blank and we can tell that it is irrelevant to the building, it will not be counted as an error for CRS purposes. The problem though is that sometimes it's not clear if the field should have been an elevation or not. That's why the NA should always be used for irrelevant or not applicable fields for a building. We'll revisit this issue for each field as we go through them. And the last thing to note for the elevations is that feet or meters should always be marked. As of now, meters is only used in Puerto Rico, since the firms show elevation in meters. But everyone else should have feet marked. Usually, if these are left blank, we will not consider it as an error, as everyone other than Puerto Rico uses feet anyway. But to be sure this is clear, make sure they are marked. Like the BFEs in Section B, elevations in Section C should be to the nearest tenth of a foot, or nearest tenth of a meter in Puerto Rico. It will not be counted as an error if they are to the nearest hundredth or thousandth, but that level of accuracy is not truly needed. Okay, let's start with the first elevation. C2A is always required. On every EC, every building has a lowest floor, so be sure there's always something there. C2B is usually required, but it depends on the building and whether there is a next higher floor. For all building diagrams, there could be an entry for C2B, depending on whether there are two or more stories to a building, if it's an elevated building with an enclosure underneath, or if the building has a crawl space for its foundation. For CRS purposes, if this is left blank for building diagrams that require it, or if pictures with the EC clearly show a next higher floor, it's an error. Encourage surveyors to place an NA in this field if it's not applicable to the building. Try not to leave it blank. We might overlook a blank, but only if the building obviously does not have a next higher floor. C2C is for the bottom of the lowest horizontal structural member for buildings that are in V zones only. So for buildings in A zones, an NA should be entered. And for buildings in V zones, there should be an elevation placed in this field. One exception. If you are a community that regulates a coastal A zone, meaning you regulate a portion or all of your A zone to V zone standards, you will want your surveyors entering this elevation on their ECs. It is not an error to show this elevation for A zone properties. It was just initially intentioned to capture this elevation for V zones since the lowest horizontal structural member is the key for insurance rating and NFIP compliance in V zone. C2D is a tricky one. Remember in our discussion for Section A, we talked about when something is an attached garage and when it isn't. If the building has an attached garage, meaning it's a non-elevated building, diagrams 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3, 4, and 9, then an elevation gets entered in this field. If the EC is for an elevated building, a diagram 5, 6, 7, or 8, then there technically is no attached garage and an NA should be entered here. If the square footage or the number of openings or anything else is entered in A9 for an elevated building, it will be considered an error if C2D is left blank, unless the surveyor's comments in Section D clearly explain all floor elevations and their uses. Field C2E causes many errors, so let's walk our way through understanding this one. This field asks for the lowest elevation of the machinery or equipment that is servicing the building, and then the surveyor is to describe the type of equipment and location of it in the Section D comments box. Remember that machinery and equipment include furnaces, AC units, hot water heaters, ductwork, sump pumps, heat pumps, generators, and elevators. It does not include water or sewer pipes, electrical lines, water meters, gas meters, electricity meters, public utility transformers, or power generators, or other pieces of equipment that are not owned by the insured. These are not insurable, so no need to identify where they are as they are not covered in the insurance policy. 
Okay, let's get a bit deeper in this issue. According to the EC instructions, a finished construction EC is supposed to be completed only once all machinery or equipment have been installed and the grading around the building is complete. So that means that if there's going to be machinery servicing the building, it must be installed, and it must be identified on the finished construction EC. The best way to avoid many errors here is not to accept a finished construction EC until all machinery are installed. You may have a building that has machinery or equipment installed on the roof, usually a commercial building or possibly a housing complex. Many surveyors think that this is obviously high enough or have difficulty shooting an elevation for it and may even have difficulty gaining entry to the building to find the equipment. So they leave the field blank assuming everything will be okay. No matter how high the equipment or where it's at, an elevation for it must be given. Insurance and compliance are affected by where the equipment servicing the building is. It must be shown on the form. Now, you may have cases where there is no machinery or equipment servicing the building. Situations like ag buildings or storage units where no heating, cooling, or hot water is required. In these cases, NA is the proper entry for this field. Also, pictures are not an adequate method of showing the elevation. The actual elevation of the lowest piece of machinery or equipment itself must be on the AC. Then, please work with your surveyors to have them describe the type and location of the equipment in the comments box in section D. Failure to have any comments in Section D is not an error, but it sure helps to have those comments whenever a reviewer has questions. Next, we get into the adjacent grades next to the building. This will help determine how high the lowest floor or next highest floor is above grade for both insurance and compliance purposes. Both C2F, the lowest adjacent grade, and C2G, the highest adjacent grade, must be entered for every building. There is always a lowest and highest adjacent grade next to the foundation of a building, so these two are always required. And lastly, C2H, we do not check for this field for CRS purposes. We are mostly concerned with building floors, equipment, and adjacent grades. Let's review which parts of Section C of the EC are required. Acquired fields include C1, C2, C2A, C2F, and C2G. Depending on your situation, fields C2B, C2C, C2D, and C2E may also be required. Fields definitely not required include C2H. The most common errors we see in Section C are not getting the finished construction EC or C1 not being marked at all. All the information may be correct on the EC, but if it's not marked for finished construction, then we can't accept it, and neither can an insurance agent, so it's considered wrong. The next common error we see is the datums for B11, which is the datum for the BFE on the map, and C2, the datum for the elevations by the surveyor not matching. It is extremely important to be able to correlate the elevation of the BFE to the elevation of the floors and machinery or equipment and adjacent grades in C2. If the datums are different and there are no convergence for how to figure out the difference between the two datums, then there is no way to know how the elevations in C2 relate to the elevation of the BFE, and therefore no way to know how to accurately rate the building or accurately determine if the building is compliant or not. The last biggest error we see, and probably the most common of all three of these, is a missing elevation for the machinery and equipment in C2E. I talked at length earlier about the importance of making sure there is an elevation in this field. For a multitude of reasons, surveyors tend to leave this field blank. Do your best to make sure an elevation is there and a description of the type of machinery and where it's located. All that information should go in the Section D comments box. Sure, there are times when there is no machinery servicing the building, but those are rare. Keep a close eye on this field. Alright, let's now turn our attention to Section D. This is a short and easy one and won't take us very long to go through, so we've included it with this video. This is the main section where the licensed professional completing the form signs, dates, and provides his or her seal to certify the information on the form represents their best efforts to interpret the available data and that any false statement is punishable by law. There are five things that we look for. First, the seal. When submitting your ECs for CRS review, know that it doesn't have to be the original seal. It can be a copy of the original form, but be sure it shows when copying so we can tell it's been sealed. Then we need to also see the certifier's name and license number along with the signature and date. 
The certifier's name and license number are important to us, as this is what you or FEMA need to know in case the surveyor needs to be contacted. And of course, the signature and date are required as a way to officially certify the document. The date is also very critical to which EC form is being used. Each form has an expiration date, and so we compare this date to the expiration date of the form to make sure it's the correct form to be using at the time it was signed. A key part of Section D is the comments section at the end. Use the comments area of Section D to provide datum, elevation, openings, or other relevant information not specified elsewhere on the certificate. This is a great way to help explain something that's not perfectly clear just using the fields provided on the form. Read through these comments when you receive an EC to make sure everything here makes sense for the building. You'll hear us mention many times throughout these videos how a surveyor can use this section to help explain or show key information. Normally we don't see a lot of errors in this section, but when we do, the ones we see are the seal missing, maybe it's a copying problem, or maybe it's a local official just not requiring one from their surveyors. But make sure you get an EC with a seal on it. No signature or date. Please be sure your surveyors sign and date the form. These components are very important. And lastly, sometimes comments should be given that help explain the situation but aren't. Or the ones provided just don't match up with all the other information on the form. Be sure the comments are nice and clear and add to the form instead of confusing it. As a reminder, we will cover how to correct errors once you identify them in a separate training video called How to Correct an Elevation Certificate. Our next training video in this series will cover how to fill out sections E and F. Thanks for watching.